We will be net zero by 2025. Unilever plans to become net zero by 2039. We've already taken about 1.2 billion euros of cost through green sourcing. You know, reducing emissions, uh, emission leaks, new equipment. Carbon credits are a way to reduce our carbon emissions and our carbon footprint to ensure a more sustainable planet for future generations. One carbon credit is a permit that allows the owner to emit one ton of carbon dioxide or other greenhouse gases without it contributing to their overall carbon footprint. Just like with most ideas, carbon credits started off with honest intentions, but loopholes have turned it into a bookkeeping trick. Credits can be a greenwashing tactic that allow companies to mislead customers without making any improvements to their business model. Researching carbon credits and offsets for this video was a shocking and eye-opening experience. There seems to be no limits to the corruption and fraudulent schemes in the carbon credit market. As Morpheus would say, let's take the red pill and see just how deep the rabbit hole goes. There are two broad types of carbon markets. The first is a mandatory cap-and-trade program. Governments set a limit or cap on the emissions permitted across a certain industry. If a company goes over their allowance, they can buy more carbon credits from their market to continue emitting gases. They may also be penalized for a violation. However, if a company reduces their emissions, they can sell or trade carbon credits to other companies. The cap and trade program provides private companies two incentives to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. They must spend money on extra credits if their emissions exceed the limit. They can also make money by reducing their emissions and selling excess credits. The second type of carbon market is the voluntary offset program. This allows businesses, nonprofits, and individuals to offset their emissions by choice. Businesses can create and sell carbon credits by reducing capturing and storing emissions through different projects, such as investing in renewable energy, improving energy efficiency, carbon and methane capture, land reforestation, returning biomass to the soil, and switching to biofuels. A big part of the voluntary offset program is corporate social responsibility. Companies can win over customers by claiming to be green, environmentally friendly, carbon neutral, and net zero. For example, Starbucks uses ethically sourced coffee, they build LEED certified stores, and they are committed to recycling and conserving water and energy. The carbon credit market was created as part of the 1997 Kyoto Protocol. This legally binding international agreement required only developed nations to cut CO2 emissions. It aimed to decrease overall emissions by 5% from 1990 levels. However, UN officials have since confirmed that Russian and Ukrainian oil and gas companies exploited loopholes and actually increased carbon emissions by 600 million tonnes. Of all the carbon credits or emission reduction units that were issued, nearly 75% of them were bogus and lacked environmental integrity. One example of bogus projects are those that stop the spontaneous ignition of coal. Large piles of coal can self-ignite and burn for several years, emitting carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxides and other poisonous gases. Several Ukrainian coal companies extracted coal from the ground, burned them in power plants and claimed millions in carbon credits. So, they made money by selling power, they made money by extracting coal from the ground, and all the emissions from burning coal in a power plant aren't counted. A second bogus project is the expansion of natural gas pipelines. Natural gas is considered to be a cleaner fuel than coal or oil, which emit more carbon dioxide. These pipeline projects were also supposed to reduce methane leaks in pipes. Many Ukrainian pipeline projects that were registered in 2012 had already started in 2003, so they weren't preventing emissions. On top of that, the assumed methane leaks were three times the real data. They were not as effective as they claimed, and their carbon credits were meaningless. A third bogus project is the treatment of greenhouse gases like chlorofluorocarbons or CFCs and hydrochlorofluorocarbons or HCFCs. In 2011, the Russian government removed extra checks in the carbon crediting process. So, companies deliberately increased their greenhouse gases by four times, then captured and destroyed them to claim millions in the carbon credits. Simply put, Russia and Ukraine were gaming the system. They took credit for projects that would have already happened or happened a decade earlier. They overestimated emission reductions and deliberately increased waste gases. 
Needless to say, these fraudulent projects were exposed and the Kyoto Protocol collapsed. The Paris Agreement of 2015 declared a new set of targets and asked all nations to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, not just developed nations. Its goal is to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius compared to pre-industrial levels. The Paris Agreement is voluntary and non-binding. It allows nations to set their own emissions goals without legal penalties if they don't meet their targets. The voluntary structure of the deal was deliberate because they were addressing the criticisms and failure of the Kyoto Protocol. The Paris Agreement was supposed to address fraudulent business practices, but companies managed to find greenwashing loopholes. Jim Hordikin, CEO of Lime Timber, recently exposed the fraudulent carbon credit system in this Bloomberg article by Ben Elgin. His company manages 1.5 million acres of U.S. forests, roughly the size of Delaware. In the past, Lime Timber made most of its revenue from chopping down trees. In 2012, they began selling carbon credits on 220,000 acres of 15% of its land. They earned $53 million from these environmental transactions over the past two years. At the risk of losing business, he exposed the flaws in the carbon credit system. For example, his company set aside a portion of forest and protected it from timber harvesting or logging. In addition to being paid for protecting the forest, they could also sell carbon credits on it, which made no sense. The trees were not going to be cut down, so the credits had no impact on the atmosphere. The oil and gas company Chevron purchased more than 20,000 of Lime Timber's carbon credits, so some of its pollution cuts were fictitious. Lime Timber also received $20 million for protecting 47,000 acres of hardwood forest in West Virginia. However, the land was so rugged and steep that the trees could not have been harvested anyway. The carbon credits issued didn't have any benefit to the climate. There are several other examples of carbon credit misuse. Environmental groups such as the Nature Conservancy and the National Audubon Society sold credits for protecting trees that weren't in danger of being harvested. This allowed companies like Walt Disney and J.P. Morgan Chase, who bought these credits, to make misleading claims of lower emissions. Green Trees, one of North America's largest carbon reforestation projects, sold credits for trees that were already planted through government programs, 10 years earlier. This resulted in inflated and meaningless carbon reduction claims by Bank of America. Here's another example of dodgy carbon credits. An oil company, Royal Dutch Shell, delivered a carbon-neutral tanker of LNG, or liquefied natural gas, to Taiwan by investing in 10-year-old forest projects in Ghana, Indonesia and Peru. In 2020, a French oil company, Total, also delivered its first shipment of carbon-neutral LNG. How can you extract natural gas in Australia, ship it to China and claim it's carbon neutral? By buying a 10-year-old wind farm in northern China called Hebei. Let's cut through all the BS. There is no such thing as carbon neutral or net zero fossil fuels. A wind farm isn't negating the emissions from burning natural gas. But the flawed carbon credit system allows companies to make such ridiculous nonsensical claims. Shell has been buying carbon credits from the Katinin Mintaya project, a 370,000-acre project to protect swamp forests in Indonesia. The project claims to prevent the release of 447 million tonnes of carbon dioxide over 60 years. It is apparently the world's largest forest-based carbon credit project. Shell and Volkswagen are two of the hundreds of companies that have bought their credits. Greenpeace claims that the credits are an illusion because the forest has been protected by the Indonesian government since 2011. In addition to these greenwashing loopholes, the actual cost of each carbon credit can vary drastically, from less than $1 per tonne to over $50 per tonne. The cost depends on the effectiveness of the carbon offset project, the location and additional benefits. For example, Bill Gates spends $600 per tonne to negate emissions from his private jet. Microsoft pays an average of $20 per tonne. On the lower end, Delta Airlines pays about $2.30 per tonne. They spent $30 million on 13 million offsets, so they were able to declare themselves carbon neutral last year. We should be very careful about such claims and question whether carbon credits that cost just $2.30 per tonne are actually helping our environment. 
In my video on planting trees, we discuss the ineffectiveness of tree planting drives. Most of those programs get millions in funding, can generate carbon credits, and then cut down the trees after 10 years. That there's a lot of this kind of fuzzy area where people are buying carbon credits for things that we don't know if they're really helping the environment at all. Tackling carbon emissions and climate change is very tricky. Carbon credits are a way to quantify emissions and pollutants, so they are a step in the right direction. But it's very important to identify loopholes, flaws or scams in the system and address them instead of ignoring them due to the fear of being labelled a climate change denier. Kyle Harrison, the head of sustainability research for Bloomberg NEF, said that the current design of the voluntary carbon market is doomed to fail. We need more insiders like Jim Hordikin to expose the problem with carbon markets. He says that weak rules have created strong incentives for landowners to develop offset projects that don't actually change the way forests are managed and therefore do little to help the climate. His company Lime Timber has decided to only sell carbon credits that genuinely benefit the climate. This has raised the cost of his company's carbon credits to $60, which unfortunately turns many clients away. It's important to balance optimism of climate change initiatives with criticism. We need to be concerned about the misuse of carbon credits because the increased cost to run businesses will eventually trickle down to us, the consumers. We should be concerned about the misuse of taxpayer money and greenwashing tactics. If you've heard of other companies like Lime Timber that are trying to fix the carbon market, leave me a comment below. Also, let me know what you think about the system and whether you've bought carbon credits to offset your flights or purchases. I'll link my Patreon page in the description. If you can support me, I'd really appreciate it. A big thank you to everyone already supporting me. I'll link all my sources in the description and on my website. Don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe button and the notification bell too. Thanks for watching. See ya.